the purpose of Communities That Care is really to make the world a better place for children and young people. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. We want the next generation to more fully realise their potential than previous generations did. In order to do that, the environment that children grow up in has to be a place where we get rid of some of the things that are actually holding children back. So we, we, talk, we talk about those as risk factors and that word is very much deliberately using the language that we know from heart health programs where we're aware of risk factors that can reduce heart health such as cholesterol and also trying to improve uh, protective factors. And again, we know that if we're physically active, that's going to be better for our heart. So, so too with children's development, that there are protective factors such as having loving relationships that can really lead them to have a much better outcome. We talk about prevention very much as being something where if we were to look at the journey a young person's going to take through their life, we know that if we can change experiences they have early on, that we're going to prevent some of the big social problems that we've currently got. So the big ticket ones that could be reduced are mental health problems, crime and the need to incarcerate people, alcohol and drug problems, relationship breakdowns and violence. All of these things have a pathway and there's a reason why people are behaving like this in our society. And what we're saying is we now know a lot about children's development, that science has grown enormously, but the community needs to be able to actually know what to do and to change the things to prevent these outcomes that are actually preventable. The key ideas really are that um, we are influenced in our behaviours by our attitudes and beliefs, so we have an orientation towards uh, a, a behaviour before we engage in it. So we know that um, really young people are making up their mind about whether they're going to use alcohol and drugs, whether they're going to stay at school from well before that decision is made. And those things are very much in, in the attitude domain before they're affecting the decision and before they come out as an actual behaviour. So social development theory can be simplified into an account to basically say it's more likely that a young person will be involved in a behaviour if they're mixing with people who they have a strong bond with or attachment to that are involved in that behaviour. What the social development theory is helping us to understand is the role that these things that we can change, skills, rewards, opportunities play in building healthy bonding. So firstly what you're trying to do is find out if there are people in the community who want to prevent the problem that you have in mind. What happens next is a group of champions get together and they form a board. Phase three then what you're doing is taking the public health approach and you're mapping the information that you're going to need. We develop a profile of the community, set targets for the things we want to reduce and the influences that we want to attack. Phase four is then setting up a plan. So basically this is where we try to harness resources into an evidence-based plan. Phase five is again, we're very serious in uh, this particular program about making sure that we get to where we said we would go. So there's further evaluation and monitoring as we move forward with a plan in communities that care. Communities of Care has its own youth survey that's been developed uh, and it was carefully developed by the originators of the program in the United States. We've actually taken that survey and adapted it for Australia through a very large research program that we undertook with the originators of the sur survey in the United States. It's trying to be just short enough that a, a, a young person can practically answer it during a school lesson and also to ask only those questions that are going to be really very helpful in prevention planning, but also needs to be comprehensive and cover the full range of issues that need to be think, thought about in youth prevention. And it also needs to take into account all the social environmental factors that are really uh, could be modified or need to be taken into account. So the youth survey gives us an idea of both uh, how high the problems are in our community, so it measures things such as substance use, antisocial behaviour, depression is measured, 
And it, but it also measures uh, whether or not children are going well at school, so we get a good indication there of something that, again, that's very important to us. And then we get an idea of their social environments. It's asking questions about how things are going in their family. Again, uh, whether or not they're getting their recognition and opportunities at school. How are we going in the community? What's it like for them in the peer group? And again, looking very closely at their own behaviour. Looking at things such as bullying, for example, which is a, an experience they might have in their peer group. If you were to measure something or identify something at one point in time, is it predictive or is it highly associated with something later on? And so a risk factor is saying, say a, a, a child lives in a family that has a lot of family conflict. Well, that's a predictor of perhaps engaging in antisocial behaviour, drug and alcohol use, and early teenage sex later on in life. So if we can intervene and reduce that family conflict, then that's going to reduce the chances that that child is going to engage in those behaviours. So a risk factor is sort of really something that is highly predictive or associated with something occurring later on in life. So a protective factor is, works in the same way. It's predictive of something not occurring. So it's about buffering the effect of harmful behaviours. So if a family, if a child lives in a warm and uh, uh, welcoming family, it gives that child opportunities to engage in a meaningful way. That's giving them an opportunity to develop meaningful relationships with an adult. And that can be protective because it gives the child a warm, comforting environment. And that'll be protective of outcomes or poor outcomes later in life. So that could be drug and alcohol use, early teenage sex, all those other things I've already spoken about. If we really want to build kids um, and put them on healthy trajectories, we've got to build in protective factors. And the social development strategy is about doing that. So it's saying what you need to do with kids is give them the opportunities to meaningfully engage in their community. Give them the opportunity to feel like they're contributing to their community and recognise that in an important public way. And if the child feels that they're contributing meaningfully and they're being recognised, well then they develop attachments to their community and the adults that are guiding them. And with that foundation, they're better off and probably more likely not to engage in those behaviours and also adapt or adopt healthy behaviours and standards that the community is trying to promote. We have brought CTC to Australia uh, uh, for now about, I think, about 12 years, and we've run some pilot communities in Australia. And probably one of our really good success stories is the Mornington Peninsula Shire. They've been running CTC for 10 years now. They've seen reduction in risk factors and increasing protective factors. But in terms of outcomes, they've seen reductions in early teenage sex, cannabis use, cigarette use and alcohol use and antisocial behaviour. If you take the time to plan well, gather your evidence and invest, you're going to get long-term sustainable change. And so we've shown that we can adapt this model to Australia and now we're trying to roll that out in far more communities in Australia at the moment.